This incident was the deadliest mass shooting ever committed in the history of the United States. So tell me, how does one man bring 21 suitcases into a hotel? We're 21 not, suitcases? 21 suitcases inside a hotel room. Welcome to Talk Murder to Me. Woo! Hello. Hey, Jen. <laughs> What's up? You know, just living the dream. Yep. One day at a time. Gotta keep plugging. So tonight we are drinking Royal Flushes, which is peach schnapps, um, raspberry liqueur, Maker's Mark whiskey, and it called for cranberry juice, but we didn't have any, so I used grenadine. And a little bit of strawberry sparkling water, and Yum. it is quite delicious. And mind you, I finished all of those bottles. I finished the peach, I finished the raspberry, I finished the whiskey, I finished the grenadine. Sweet. So cheers to having a lighter liquor cabinet. The drink is really good. It's delightful. Ooh, I like that. I There's a lot that. of booze in there. Good. You can really taste that peach. Mm. Mm -hmm. I like it. I didn't have black tea, but I was going to use the peppermint tea, and I, I was like, "Well, then you don't. We don't need mint." We have Maker's Mark. In the thing. Yeah, we not anymore. No. How do you guys afford that? I bought it. Mm. At BJ's it's in the really liquor good. store. Yeah, we you we're, have a liquor store in BJ's. Yeah, yes. I didn't know that. We, I we you fi only we're sold finally wine. we finally cleared out the whiskey from the party. We still have some rum left. So why don't we buy it at BJ's instead of the other place? Because we don't have as much of a selection. Oh, yeah, so yeah. If we're looking And it's for like handles, you know, big big bottles. Which, not a problem. No. But, but if we're looking for something specific, then, um, you know, like something ge uh, something more general, like whiskey or rum, like that. Yeah. I can buy good, it. Yeah. Good for the... The soul. It right. is good that for the soul. That, too. It's good for the handles. For the love handles. I realized that's yes. why I gained all my weight back last year. It was because we were drinking so much. That is it. Yeah. Booze does a lot. We're I getting back wanna... on track this we week, are. though. Yes. I, did, I went shopping. I went cooking. She Sweet. asked if I cooked for a restaurant. <laughs> I know. I, I was actually really excited because... I was um because when I came home, you're like, oh, this pad thai and chicken. And I always saw it all packed up. I was like, yeah, you were going to be eating healthy again. <laughs> we're back, we're back on track. We've gotten a couple of fun stuff from from Taco Supremo. So one of our tacos, Alicia and Jonathan. Which, by the way, hi Ringo, the starfish. Oh Ringo! Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, I get it, Ringo starfish. Oh, I didn't get. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I do get it now. That's awesome. I didn't. I didn't put the two and two together. I didn't now. either. And I saw the picture of the starfish. Ringo, I starfish, automatically yeah. thought of. Um, um, Pearl from Finding yeah, the yeah, 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 I did too. Jonathan, you should tell us all about starfishes. How long do they live? Starfish. Starfishes. Right. <laughs> They're starfishes. If he's got more than one. I don't know if he has more than one. But anyway, shout out to Ringo. And you guys drove by the Gypsy Rose Blanchard house. That was really cool, but yeah. really eerie at the same Snapped time. Snapped some pics. Yeah, somebody said it wasn't uh, pink anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I, I didn't know if, that was, if it was really pink or if that I was just I wonder who's living there now. I, I think it's empty. I thought they said they don't. Uh, they said they don't know. The coverings are still hashtag there. free Gypsy Rose. Oh no! Please. I love you, Gypsy. Well, not in a weird way, but you know, maybe you're the oh. secret. Like <laughs> maybe you're the one that she's engaged yeah. to. Hmm. In a more of a candy way. Ew. <laughs> oh, shit. oh, so one of our Taco Supremos, Shannon. Um, has some really crazy connections with a couple of serial killers, both Ted Bundy and Gary Ridgway. So she posts in the forum, and I'm going to share it with you guys. So her brother worked the same, same shift as Gary Ridgway in the paint department at Kenworth Trucking, which we've talked about before. Other than uh, reading and highlighting in his Bible under the staircase at work and trying to keep a low profile, this avid lover of button-down flannel shirts with pocket protectors <laughs> used to leave random pieces of jewelry in the woman's bathroom during his shifts. Oh, my God. Interesting. Anyone who was the lucky finder of the treasure would generally wear it around work, talking about how strange it was to keep finding jewelry in the bathroom. Little did they know, women at Kenworth would wear these pieces so he could constantly be surrounded by the remains of his victims. <gasps> oh, yeah! my gosh. He loved being reminded of his victim so much that he brought the corpse no of one way. woman to what? work 
with him one day, leaving her in an abandoned car in the parking lot for a few weeks, unbeknownst to the employees coming in and going through the lot. Lastly, part of the benefit of working in the paint department was so that you would have access to paint to touch up your car. Ridgeway took full use of this and painted his truck every so often when he knew the police were looking for his truck. After advancements in the DNA collection, Kenworth was instrumental in linking Gary to the murders. Traces of paint they found inside some of the bodies was a patented pearl color that only Kentworth produces. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So apparently trolling the internet on company time isn't the worst thing you can do at work. Who knew? Wow. Yeah. He used to stick uh, he would stick like religious Bible uh, pages in the victims. Yeah, I remember you saying that. What's a pocket protector? I know it isn't it something that you put in your shirt pocket so that pen when you put pens yeah, in pens there don't explode. They don't. Or if pens they do don't explode. explode. So if the ink yeah, in the, the pens ink. explode, it doesn't what get on your shirt. What pen do you use that explodes? <laughs> like, okay, not shit. like day. This is from like, not like <laughs> exploding like a combustion. We mean like. Have the, you seen my pen? That that's an ink. That's a pen explosion. The one the, the no. on your desk. You know how that is. Like a you huge, just don't know how to use it. That is that what is a, a very expensive ex- fountain what, pen. Okay, but the ink bled everywhere. With what they call in the very end a nib. NIB, you can have a fine nib or a more heavy nib. I like heavy nibs, I think. I I prefer (laughs) the fine nibs. (laughs) (laughs) I prefer the fine nibs. Surprise shots, surprise shots. We don't know what they are because they're a surprise. This is exactly what we drank last week. It is not. It is not what we drank last week. It's the same color. It's a little different. No, it's not. It's the same. It's a little different. It smells exactly the same as it did last week. That's what she said, or he said. Oh, that's gross. Oh, that's what you were talking about last week, the Fruit Loop vodka. That's a Fruit Loop vodka. With the Fruit Loop with the strawberry berries. I liked that. No. I, th- I thought it tasted like sh- Fruit Loops and milk. It was good. Yeah, Fruit Loops and milk taste good, not Fruit Loops and strawberry I milk. also noticed I that you guys good. brought cereal home the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the cereal, John, because I, um, I came home and you were like, do you want some cereal? And I'm like, we never have cereal in the house. We ate a lot of it cereal. It was my fault. I said I, have been, I would love a bowl of cereal, but I was fine with not having cereal. And I cereal. ate Raisin Bran. What did you have, Nicole? Crackling Even brand. though you know I have that fear Crackling of raisin bran. Oat bran. Oat bran. Crackling oat bran. So underrated. I've Delicious. never even heard of that before. So good. I wish I was here for the cereal picking because I would have got some cereal too. But so I was working. The secret is you buy <laughs> you buy regular flakes, wheat flakes, mm-hmm. and then you buy raisins separate. Because raisin bran, they're notorious for not putting enough raisins in. They say two scoops. Two scoops ain't enough, man. You know what I'm saying? John loves his raisins. Yeah, exactly. So John you gotta loves raisins. You got which to is put weird. It's not weird. Raisins are healthy. They're not. But it's good. It's not processed bullshit. Fair. You know what cereal I like that's kind of underrated? Mm. Grape nuts. They I are. like grape nuts. Grape they're crunchy nuts. and they taste really good. The hint was high roller, so gin. Where are we going and who are we killing? Sounds like we're going to Vegas. Maybe there might be a crime at a casino. Um, Someone gets too knowledgeable about the inner workings of a casino and then they get killed off. I think this is a story that is based off of that movie 21 where the kids are really smart and they start counting cards. Ooh. And it's a good movie. It's got Kevin Spacey in it, right? Yeah, before his oh, I don't rapid decline. It. No, no, well, before his decline. I thought wait, you were gonna say before he wait, was wait. like what did he actually do? I know I, I know I'm not getting in that discussion. He <laughs> I've learned my lesson. He is assaulted. He's a sexual man. predator. I, I did another Anthony man? Ra- yeah. yeah, Anthony Rapp. Oh shit, I didn't know that. Kevin Spacey's gay. Yeah. Oh really? He came out. I mean there's nothing wrong with that. He, he came no, out as like, part of the whole thing. Yeah. Part of the He came out. Because as a gay his, man, because his assaults were male, and then he tried to use that as a way to justify it, and that totally backfired on him too. Because like, you don't assault people because you're gay; you assault people because you're a sexual predator. Yeah, Anthony Rapp is the star of Rent. I know that <laughs> I do not have any grounds to talk on this subject, so usually I just shut up. That's good. Good for you. So I think we're going to Massachusetts. Massachusetts, they don't gamble there. They do. They went to Harvard in the movie. Oh, MIT. 
Oh, and MIT. There, there are casinos in Massachusetts now. Are there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Plain Ridge. Um, they're going to make another one in Taunton. I've never been to a casino in the United States. I have. I have. So this story is going to be a little hard for me to get out, but I want to try to do it as much justice as I can. There is a fan of Talk Murder to me that has listened to every episode, and she emailed me, and she says something along the lines of, John, I listen to all the podcast episodes. I really love what you guys do. I'm currently struggling. And she heard it. She heard me talking about my PTSD mm-hmm. going yeah. through what I went through with combat and then, you know, my recent the PTSD therapy with the oxygen. And she was really interested in that mm-hmm. because she has PTSD. And then as I started reading more in the email, I saw she was from Vegas, and I'm like, oh, my God, I know where this is going. She was actually at the shooting that took place in 2017. Wow. She was in the crowd. I saw some pictures that you sent. You were right in the front. Yeah, I was right on the right-hand side. A girl that runs a... Um, I'd helped her out a few times and she called me up and she's like, Hey, you know, I have an extra wristband, you know, do you want to come with me to this concert? And I was like, fuck yeah. You know, <clears throat> well, John, normally I wouldn't go out on a Sunday night to begin with, yeah. but we just wanted to go out and have a good time. Her fiance at the time actually dropped us off there. And, um, with the wristband, you, it depended, it was dependent upon like the color, but they had different sections set up. You know, like a House of Blues tent. They had like a beer garden, and yeah. we we just went into the general general pop, I guess, and moved up to the right hand side of the stage, which turned out to not be a very good idea um, in the long run. Oh my god! So she it. emailed me and said, "I trust that you could tell my story for me." So this is wow. going to be her story. Wow, that's what a huge honor! honor. Yeah. Wow, thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. And I'm not going to release her name because, as you'll see later, this story isn't over yet. Mm. And let me ask you something. How much do y'all know about this? Y- y'all know about the shooting, right? Yes. Yes, yes definitely. I might, I remember it, it was a shooting at a concert. Who was it? Brad? No, not Brad Paisley. It was... Um, I don't know. When you really heard about it, it one or two times, did you hear about it any time else? Honestly. Or did it get drowned out? Honestly, it gets drowned out because there are so many mass shootings. This is the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history. Really? That wow. has happened two years ago. And if you type in that hotel, he was in the Mandalay Bay oh, hotel. Okay. So I type in Mandalay Bay and I'm like, what? Are you sure this is it? I it's hit a the, really risky I hit the, hotel. Yeah. I hit the next page of Google. Still nothing but, like, new press releases on all the stuff they're doing and all kinds of stuff. Hit the next page. It wasn't until the seventh page of Google where I saw anything about the shooting. Wow. Really? Okay. That's now, disgusting, A actually. lot of people that yeah. I have talked to personally, some of the other victims, too, and some of the other people that are just super pissed off about this case, they have all said the same thing. The deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history, and no one fucking knows about it. Hmm. Okay? Mm, that's disgraceful. You don't know about it. No one knows about it. No one knows about this story. You, you, Yeah, you heard of it, but you don't sure. know about it. Like, you know about Columbine, and you know about all them other stories. Yeah, other, like, school shootings mm-hmm. and things like that. And yeah. then when you peel back the onion, guess what's in the middle? A roll of fucking bills, like always. That's why you don't hear about it. What do you mean? I'll get to that later. But like I'm, corruption? I'm saying that you don't you don't hear about the story and that's a problem. That's a big fucking yeah. problem with me. So we're gonna be hearing from her tonight. Awesome. I had an hour phone call with her and I, I could tell in her voice that sh- she's not completely healed. And that bothers me. Well, I don't because nothing can really heal you. The best way to heal is to have your story out there and to put it in the open and that is impossible with this story and I, I swear to God everyone if you do any research you'll see the same theme hmm. this case has been swept under the rug no one knows about this case where's the motive what happened why isn't the FBI doing anything more about this it's it's 
bullshit on a national scale, and I think it should be addressed. It's awful. I don't know the story, but I, knowing John, I know that he has done nothing but research this case to make sure that we get all the facts right and get the story out there correctly. So um, to our listeners, we really hope you enjoy this case. Um, so take yeah. it away, John. This was not a fun case. I'm telling you that right now. It's like... The great thing about the the internet and everyone's gotten a cell phone and all this stuff is there is a lot of videos out there. Mm. You go to YouTube and you type in Vegas shooting and you'll find all kinds of cell phone videos. And if you can't find them, email me. I'll send you every one that I found. And I found about 100 and I just barely looked. Everyone had a cell phone. Everyone was recording. That's beautiful. I love that. That shows transparency about what actually happened. Mm. Okay. That's terrifying at the it's same time. It's terrifying as yeah. hell, yeah. And I've watched all of them and, you know, I, I, I've been in that – I've been in situations where I was, you know, being pinned down. And so we're going to talk about not only the shooting, the victims. We're also going to talk about the mass psychology of crowds going through a panic such mm. as that. Well, I'm going to show you videos about when the shooting starts, what the crowd is doing. There's two theories of group psychology in panic situations, and we're going to kind of go through. It's really interesting, and you can see it here because of the videos. I was in a uh, class in college my senior year. It was called Political Responses to Crisis, and we had talked about a couple of specific cases, like the Bali uh, terrorist attack. It was like at a nightclub in Bali, yeah, and the terrorists used like the first bomb as a diversion to get people towards the wow. second bomb so that they could have more victims. Yeah. That's sick. Um, and I remember being in that class, and that was actually when the Boston Marathon bombings had happened. And my personal story with that, my mom was at the finish line cheering somebody else on when that had happened. What? And I remember knowing about what time her friend was finishing the race. So I called right around that time and I said, "Hey, you know, how how's it going?" and she said, "I just heard um loud noises. I think it's a a gunshot." And we had just talked about the Bali murders and I turn on the news, nothing's on. So this was I was talking to my mom about this before it was even on the news. And I remember telling her, "Do not run towards the sound." Go in the opposite direction and stay put. And then like 15 minutes later, it hit the news. Oh, my God. I, I didn't even know that. That's crazy. Yeah. It's sad that we're, we have to live in this world where we have to be fearful. And that's the point that, that – but and we, we shouldn't can't, have to be. We shouldn't have to be. And I'm not saying don't be afraid, but at the same time, that's the, that's the aim of terrorists. They want you to fear them. Yeah. If, they don't want. We don't call them, you know, rainbow and sunshinists. They invoke terror, and that's what they want to do. Yeah, their our fear it fuels them. All right, so mm-hmm. a little information. I'm gonna go about the concert and everything. I'm gonna give you a little information about the shooter. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about the weapons. Then we're gonna get into the actual videos. This is going to be a very graphic episode. I know it's on audio, but I'm going to play the videos, and you'll hear people screaming. You'll hear the gunshots and everything else. So, I mean, this is real shit, and that's why – but there's your warning, you know. I mean, this is real life. This is what happened. So I'm going to play it all. The night was October 1st, 2017. It was at the Route 91 Harvest Festival. Now, that was held annually from 2014 to obviously – you know, 2017. It was across from the Mandalay Bay Resort, which we're going to talk about, and the Luxor Las Vegas Hotel, which I've never been to Vegas. Me neither. Me either. So the only thing I know about the setup of this street is from what I saw on Google Earth. This was Jason Aldean. He's a country singer. I don't know any of his songs. Y'all can sing one. No, I probably, if, if it came on, I probably would recognize it. He, he's a famous country singer. Yeah, so this was his second time. The first one he did 2014 and then 2017. He was the headliner. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about the strategy from what we know about the shooter. He planned everything in great detail. Okay, there's a reason that he chose this venue because there was another 
festival that a lot of people don't know this. There was another festival that he was going to commit this act first. That was the Life is Beautiful Festival, hmm. which was right down the road. Hmm. That was like Blink-182 headliners, or not headliner, but Blink-182 was there, some other bands. And he actually stayed in that hotel by that specific festival, but he didn't carry out the act. When police actually searched his computer, the recent history was him looking up the expectant attendance of each concert. Oh, when he ended up picking the exactly. So he picked the the Route ninety one because he weighed his options and he was very detailed in his planning. He was very detailed in his planning. What a jack. Okay, there was 22,000 people that attended the concert. And I want to say there was 58 people that were killed, ultimately. Wow. Now, you'll see sources that say 59, but that is including the killer because he took his own life with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Coward. I I don't include him in that. I say 58 because... He's not a victim. He's not a victim. He's, you know... 422 people were wounded... But, Whoa. yeah, that was just initially, but when the panic broke out, the number rose to 851. What? Yeah. So do the math on that. 22,000 people, 851 wounded. Wow. And as the nice young lady that emailed me about this story wanted me to tell her story, that she was actually one of those that was wounded. Wow. I did break my, uh, my left arm, and then I broke um, my kneecap. I tore my meniscus. And my ACL. She had shrapnel, which is probably most likely still there because shrapnel doesn't leave your body unless you get it removed. And some other um, some other injuries, too. I got hit with a little bit of shrapnel on the left-hand side of my shoulder. The shooter, I'm going to just go over a brief right now just to get you guys into the story before we start. His name was Stephen Paddock. He was a 64-year-old man from Mesquite, Nevada, which is about 100 miles away from where this took place. He actually owned a home there in Mesquite. Oh, yeah. I remember it, him being an older male and thinking, that just feels like a strange profile. Yeah, don't you have anything better to do with your life? Shouldn't you be retired? But something? also, like, it just sound, seems like very old to carry something like this mm-hmm. out. Mm. Like, most serial killers or killers that we cover have an experience when they're younger. I mean, not all. Like, we've covered people that are older in age when they continue carry out murders, but I just remember thinking, like, wow, he's that's old to commit a mass attack like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here's one of the big problems with this case is the closure is almost impossible to get because most people like this would leave at least a manifesto or they'll leave a suicide note. Like something that or explains something. why. Or, I mean, this guy was so private in his own life that it was it's near impossible to see what was going on. You know what I'm saying? You don't under, like, we don't understand where the hate came from. We have no idea. Now, well, that, now I'm not talking about you guys. I'm not talking about the conspiracy guys. There is a huge conspiracy with this case, and I'm not saying that there's not. Hmm. Okay. There may have been a note there. It may have been seized. It is not in public yet. A lot of the pictures show a note of some sort written. They claim it was trajectories and calculations. So I reached out and I contacted our good friend and talking supremo, Alan, as you'll remember him from the uh, Bonnie and Clyde episode, and I asked him, about the suicide note or if it was indeed calculations and if it was calculations what calculations would need to be made bullets when fired have a set drop rate based on their speed or velocity and the mass that the actual bullet is carrying a bullet like a 308 weighs more so it's going to have less of a um, deviation in its trajectory as it's flying, i.e., 223, 556 at 1,000 yards, you got to worry about wind. A 10 mile an hour, 15, 20 mile an hour breeze at the end of your flight path of the bullet can put you off inches, you know, inches, half a foot. It can, it can make a big difference. A heavier bullet, while has a increased drop rate as it loses its momentum due to the gravitational pull, all those things he could have factored in mathematics. If he knew his distance 
from point A to point B, knew his speed, knew the gravitational pull, there is mathematics that can kind of help you that they can use to figure out the drop rate of a round. So if you're at you know, if you're at 500 yards, you're going to want to shoot. If you're 500 yards, two, two, three, five, five, six, you might want to have your yourself your sights dialed in an inch or two high, so that as the bullet travels its flight path, it's going to drop and then hit where you're actually shooting at. Any math that he would do, that would be what he was doing the mathematics for, was calculating the flight path based based on the velocity and um, distance of the rounds versus, uh, versus the weight of each one of them. The fan that contacted me, the nice young lady that contacted me, I could tell she was struggling with that. I asked her, since the shooting, have you tried to figure out why this happened? And she told me she tried everything she could, but she could not figure out, and I know that's a burden on her because she'll never know. No one will ever know. And that's sad. Have you done any research on the uh, the shooter or anything or? Yeah. Yeah. You know? uh, a lot, a lot about the shooter and then um, his girlfriend, Mary Lou, yeah. whatever the fuck her name is. I've read, I've read up about Paddock. Yeah. That's good that you actually went and tried, you know, try to understand. Cause I mean, this case it's apparently the the shooter still doesn't, there's no motive that they found. No, that's, that's what they say. And me personally, I have a hard time kind of swallowing that. Now, this entire incident that we're going to be talking about, this entire incident, how long do you think it took to kill 58 people, Jen? How long do you think it took to kill 58 people and wound 851? How many minutes or hours you think it took for all this to go down what type of weapon was he using he was using ar type automatic rifles five minutes i was gonna say actually i was going to, to say less than people. less than five minutes it took approximately 10 minutes oh we're looking at 1005 to 1015 this incident was the deadliest mass shooting ever committed in the history of the United States. They found, and this kind of makes me sick to my stomach, 23 guns inside of his hotel suite. 23 guns. Wow. Okay. You'll hear talk about how hard it was even before the shooting for her to even go into the Mandalay Bay Hotel and not be noticed. The security is so tight there. Oh, you have three bags? What's in that? What's in that bag? You know, what's in that bag? What are you bringing in here? Security's tight. So why don't Be you tell me before? how, how, yeah, before, before this happened. No, so how, so tell me, how does one man bring 21 suitcases into a hotel. We're 21 going, suitcases? 21 suitcases inside a hotel room. A lot of the things that he got away with, such as bringing in all of those fucking guns into the room, a yeah. normal person, you and I, that shit would not fly. And we have video of all those suitcases coming up, what? carried by a bellman. Through the service elevator, of course, not the not the guest elevator, the service elevator. What? Told you the hint was high roller. You think this is just a normal guy? They have a, an entire system at the Wynn Casino to where you can't do that. And they, they look for signs such as that because somebody, a lot of people come here. There's a very high suicide rate of people who just even visit that uh, they have, you know, protocols in, in place to for them to try to avoid something like this. So why didn't the Mandalay Bay have something like that? Yeah. It's fucking crazy to me. You know, this is not their first rodeo. They've been around a long fucking time. And even though MGM right now claims they don't know him, never, I don't know this guy. Okay. He w wait, he was a high roller and a frequented the Mandalay Bay? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <gasps> oh. That His job was gambling. That was his job. What? I, I don't understand how people can make gambling their job. I, I spent $10. At it. Okay, so 
23 guns, including 11 AR-15 style rifles with bump stocks. So a bump stock is an aftermarket accessory. It replaces the rear stock section that, uh, that sits up against your shoulder with a unit that allows the body of the rifle to slide in and out of this particular piece. What happens is every time it slides back, the recoil sends the rifle back. And when it resets or comes back forward, your finger sits against a guard. And that guard, when it slides back forward, hits your, the trigger hits your finger again and causes it to fire another shot. So that's the basics of how the bump stock works. There were eight AR-10 rifles, a bolt action rifle, and a revolver, the one that he shot himself with. So now you guys got the basic overview of it, right? Mm -hmm. My initial thoughts are when you're going back to what was his motive, there was no motive. You would think that someone like this just, if they didn't write anything, they just wanted their name out there. No, he did not want his name out there. Yet no, none of us ever heard of this guy. I, I also, I'm not trying to belittle the case at all, but the immediate thought that pops into my head is inside job slash scapegoat slash conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of conspiracy theories on mm-hmm. this case, and one of the reasons it is like that is because no one knows about this damn case. Yeah, you type in Vegas. You type in Vegas right now and see if this even shows up. Oh, of course not. Okay, it doesn't show up. And that's the reason, because you know why? Well, Vegas is known for a lot of things. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, Uh, right? Come on now, it's their slogan. (laughs) All right. You have to go to like the sixth page of Google to find any news about it. And I was like, you got to be kidding me, man. I mean, this is... that's Vegas for you, though. They don't. They don't want to to taint the image at all. I've lived here all my fucking life. There's shit that happens on the strip that never even makes the news that I could tell you about. Of course, they don't want to. You know, they're running a billion dollar corporation. MGM yeah. has a lot of fucking money. And do you think that they want to paint their image with something like this? Like, this is a big fucking deal. Oh, that's bad. I do want to go there one day. <sighs> no, fuck Vegas. You'll never want to go there after hearing this story. Okay. All right, so here's where we're going right here. I'm, a sh- I'm showing them a picture right now if you guys want to explain what you're seeing. So, um, it's part of... All right, so let me this, explain it. Let me explain it. Part of the strip let me now. explain it. All right, so this is the strip. Las Vegas Boulevard is the strip. It was formerly called Route 91. You see the Mandalay building up there to the right yep. on the screen. Mm-hmm. There's two holes like in the building. window, mm-hmm. and I'm going to show you why. He rented a suite and an adjacent room. Really? So he has two hotel rooms. Okay, now. Those are, that's a lot of windows. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a suite, it's, you know, and but then that's big. Now the Route ninety one Harvest Country Music Festival is right down below the Mandalay, right on the street, and it is approximately eleven hundred feet away, which is like three hundred and forty eight yards or something like that. So if you're thinking a football field mm-hmm. away, so that's a pretty pretty far away to to aim, you know, right. your rifle. And then you'll see these fuel tanks, which I'm going to talk about here in a little bit, about 2,000 feet away. So he was aiming from the 32nd floor on in his suite that he rented a week earlier. And I'm going to take you through the entire bringing in the suitcases. It took days to do this. From his suite at the 32nd floor, he had a, a perched up view, a sniper's view of the crowd below. So it was pretty much easy picking. That's terrible. As I said, Jason Aldean is playing from 10 p.m. And 2,200 people were in the crowd watching him. The first shots that came out were single shots. The the weapons he killed people with were AR-type rifles, so automatic rifles, you know. Mm -hmm. Not fully automatic, but they had the bump stocks that kind of make them more automatic. The first shots were single shots fired. Now, this is very important because was it like testing it, like to make sure it would, he, it would go the distance. 
There's two theories. One of them is more plausible than the other. There were at least two piercings, gunshot piercings, through these fuel tanks that you see 2,000 feet away. So if, if, you, if you Google the image, just type in um, Route 91 shooting layout or whatever, you'll see the fuel tanks. Mm-hmm. They're about 900 feet away from the crowd. He was out of the east-facing window, the first window of yeah. his Mandalay hotel room. He shot those single shots into the fuel tank. Now, these are jet fuel. He was using special incendiary rounds. He was using these special incendiary rounds. And what he was planning to do, from what we can understand, is ignite these fuel tanks. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. He wanted to ignite the fuel tanks because... He wanted to try to blow the whole thing up. Well, no, here is my kind of theory behind this. You see the crowd over here. Mm -hmm. They're massed right here. Okay, he's trying you, to push you them don't. In one direction. He's trying to push them back towards the hotel to get them closer. And the to way him. he does that is ignite these fuel tanks. But did they blow up? They no. did not blow up. So he he shoots at he them. He did. And sh- happened. He shot nothing them. Happens. He shot the fuel tanks, and they did not blow up. So plan A was likely to blow up the fuel tanks, push the crowd towards him, and he would have an even easier time. That's that's my out. theory of he's trying to push the crowd. Not push the crowd, yeah, but yeah, yeah. not having people run out that way. Right. Yeah, you but know. he's pushing them towards him versus yeah. away from and him. And plus he'd be causing more carnage if they did explode because of the people in the surrounding area of the fuel tank explosion. Okay, so here are the single shots. It's very important to hear the single shots. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? Yes. Yeah. Now, Sounds like firecrackers from yeah. that area, too. That's a good point. Keep that in mind. It does sound like firecrackers. Throughout this, the first single shots and the first burst to the second burst, Jason Aldean is still on stage playing, okay? Because it sounds like nothing. Yeah, exactly. One of the questions I asked Alan is, is it possible to ignite jet fuel with these special rounds that he was using an incendiary bullet would be a projectile that has a sort of ignitable substance on the bullet that's actually activated after or as the round is striking its target. I've not really heard of anybody ever using them for anything. Most people refer, they think an incendiary, you see on YouTube, a target blows up when they shoot it. That's actually a, an incendiary target. They make targets that when you shoot them with a round and it penetrates, it ignites a powder or a substance inside of the target that makes the target explode. But an incendiary bullet, they have made them, and it has a metal-like strike tip on it that ignites the actual substance after it uh, hits whatever you're shooting at. And the question that I'm asked is, do I think it could make it ignite? I'm pretty sure Mythbusters did a test on trying to get gas tanks or fuel tanks of some sort to ignite. And really the big problem with getting it to ignite is you would have to hit it at a certain point as to allow the ignition to happen at a level in the tank in which the fuel vapor is concentrated, but you have enough oxygen to provide the the reaction between the two compounds. So, i.e., if you shoot a bullet into an open or into a gas tank like you see in the movies and it blows up, Mythbusters tried that one desperately, even with uh, tracer rounds, and there's not enough oxygen to cause the reaction like you see in films. So that's another one of those film busted things that they uh, the Mythbusters group did. All right, so like Nicole said, there was two theories here. The first theory was he was checking the range and trajectory of the shot. The second was he was firing at the jet fuel tanks, which he definitely hit that were 2,000 feet away. 30 seconds later, this is at 10.06, there is the first round of automatic gunfire. You can tell he's worried. And then he stays through the whole first burst because you'll hear a lot of people think it was fireworks, firecrackers, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then he books it, and then you'll start seeing a lot of people towards the exit start leaving, okay? 
You can you can tell in the video like he hears it and then it doesn't he, know he what steps to do. away he steps away from the mic and then he s- tries to keep singing and then he finally realizes what's going on. So during the first few bursts, you'll see that a lot of people were unsure what was going on. You'll see multiple videos of people saying it's not gunfire, it's firecrackers. <laughs> Did you hear that? Doesn't sound like a real gun. That's not that, a real gun. That sounds like it a doesn't gun. sound like a real gun. And as soon as he said that. That is a real gun. That is a real gun. No, it's not. And that's one of the things I really want to bring up in this podcast because if you're ever in an active shooter situation, which there's gonna be more, let's be honest. This is the world we're living in right now. If you're ever in an active shooter situation, I want you to at least know the difference between a firecracker and an automatic rifle. Did you hear the first single shots fired? And as soon as you heard them, did you, I mean, what was going through your mind? Did you just think that was fireworks or something else? So the first, um, I want to say like the first three or four. Yeah. uh, We kind of were like, what's that, you know? And we just kind of looked at each other and then started looking around because it was October. So out here in Vegas, it's, you know, a little bit cooler out and there's always a light breeze. Yeah. And I just think, I I remember this like it was yesterday. I could smell the, like the gunpowder. And I'm not, yeah. She notices gunpowder. She smells gunpowder, which I didn't. That's, I mean, she, she actually told me that she grew up around weapons, which is definitely an advantage. Yeah, for sure. Cause I know I wouldn't recognize exactly. that. Exactly. A, no- a normal is. person would not know this. At a hundred percent. Absolutely. I could smell it. And that's when I knew I was like, holy fuck, someone is shooting. And, um, I text, oh, I told my, my girlfriend that and she's like, what? No. And then people start yelling, you know, get down, get down. So we dropped to the ground, and then there was more gunfire. I mean, I knew that it was real, but I didn't really understand until I started seeing blood. It's not a real gun. That doesn't sound like a real gun. It is a real gun. It's not a real He says, there's no flashing. I'm going to bring that up. I asked Alan about that. I, uh, I remember when I saw him, when I saw some of the videos right after it happened, I remember seeing muzzle flash. Now, this was all the way back when it had just happened. So who knows what is or isn't out there anymore. There's no muzzle flash. Usually if someone is shooting, I mean, look how dark it is. Yeah. You have well, a, a it's round. It's so far away, though. You would, in theory, still see some sort of muzzle flash. Maybe. I don't know. The the distance may affect that. But it's also hard to tell where it's coming from at this point too, yeah. you know? But at this point, I mean think about it, it's country music. Everyone's been drinking all day, and nothing wrong with that. We I mean we're sitting here drinking right now. But I mean, it's country music. Of course there's gonna be firecrackers and stuff, right? So I mean half it's the America. people half the people are thinking it's a real gun, half the other people are thinking it's firecrackers. So you can see where the chaos is already building. Yeah. You know what? I hope the entertainment leaves. I hope the entertainment leaves. It's a real gun. That's a real fucking gun. When the entertainment leaves, it's a real gun. Mm. (laughs) Remember that. If you're ever at a concert and the singer bolts off stage, then you probably know it's a real gun. Now, this is one that I love that you've asked, is how can someone be sure they're hearing gunfire and not fireworks? especially around 4th of July weekend, which we've got coming up here not too long off. I've gone about, and there's always that question. I see it all the time um, living out my ways. Is somebody hearing gunfire? Is somebody hearing fireworks? Are those fireworks? And the only thing that I can say is, if you can, try to find an outdoor shooting range and park yourself about you know a half mile away from it. And just listen, because there is a definitive difference between pistol, rifle, uh, shotgun, and fireworks. 
Typically, gunfire has a much sharper sound to it. It's more. It has just. It has more of an impact sound. In it. And it's hard to describe, but that's about as best I could do. Is the sound of a gunfire is much sharper. Um, there's you'll hear fireworks. They have a dull kind of thud. As soon as Jason Aldean ran off the stage, the stadium lights were turned on. If you saw, they're mm-hmm. on. Yeah. It's kind of like the band's gone, you know, when they yeah at you know, the end of the, a after show. the encore yeah. and everything. Is that is that the best idea to have? Because now you have a shooter. Oh no! Yeah, you can see where people are. Just think about that. Now he has. Shit. Now he's got the proper lighting. Yeah, and I thought about this a lot. Also, you know, like was he able to see better? Oh while, yeah. Like, while while so, the lights were on, is that is that why they did it? I mean, I don't know, but it was completely fucking pitch black dark in that place. <laughs> Can you tell the difference between the sound mm-hmm. when one of it's kind of muffled? Yep. The yeah, one sounds a little bit deeper. And one's crackling. Da, yep. da, 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 da. I can personally attest to, I know the difference between a whiz and a crack. A mm-hmm. crackle. If a bullet is crackling, it's breaking the sound barrier right by your face, pretty much. I mean, let's be honest. That's not a good sign no. at all. The reason you hear the different sounds in the same burst, because basically he's holding down the trigger, yeah. but he's shooting it like he would shoot a Tommy gun. That's why you hear the different sound, the, the timber or whatever you call the musical tone. You hear the low muffled, and then you hear the loud cracking because he's literally spraying back and forth. Mm. All right, this is from the DailyBeast.com. This is from a British soldier that has spent 24 years in the British Army. With a firearm like an AR-15, soldiers learn to recognize the sound of high-velocity rounds through training that places them in a range where shots are fired behind a bank. As the round passes them, they can first hear the crack. That's what you hear in the video, the crack, 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 crack. As the bullet breaks the sound barrier, like I said earlier, then the thump of the round being fired. So you can hear the bullet before you can hear the bullet being shot out the, the barrel. Does that, does that make sense? The bullet's going at such a high velocity towards you that it breaks the sound barrier. And by the time, and, and the sound wave from the bullet ejecting is still, is lagging behind. Oh. Does that make sense? So you hear the cracking before you hear the thump. Uh huh. That's what he's trying to say. If I got that right, if not. You're listening, you hear the crack of the bullet, and then you're listening to the direction the thump came from. The further away the round was fired at you from, the greater the time distance between the crack and the thump, okay? In Hmm. this open countryside, this can be a useful way of determining which direction an active shooter might be firing from. But in a place like the Las Vegas Strip, which is highly built up, or even a natural area with tall mountains, the degree of echoing would make it much more difficult to pinpoint that direction. And that last line, he said, much the, the degree of echo, remember that, because when the police get there, as I'm going to mention later, the police are on the scene, they think it's more than one shooter. You said that uh, you thought there may be two shooters. Is I that, did. Why is that exactly? You know what? I've I've racked my brain about this like over and over and over and over. I don't know if I legitimately thought that or if I was just fucking scared. But then as the night went on, I just kept thinking to myself, there's no way. I thought there was multiple people because of the the destruction that I saw. You know, I I just thought in my head, there's no way possible physically that one person could cause all of this. There's no fucking way. As the night went on and um, what seemed like, you know, two hours to me, which in reality it wasn't that long, there was, you know, still still rounds being fired and it was going all over the fucking venue. Picture yourself. I mean, you're watching the videos, one thing. Put yourself there just for a little few seconds. It's safe, I promise. You're just in your mind. And you're getting shot at and you're hearing that those two different tones – from the same rifle being fired, you think 
there's an active shooter. You don't know he's in the hotel. He may be three people down from you. You have no idea. Put yourself in the, the, the mindset of the people in the crowd. They are screwed. They have no... They don't know where they, to go they don't, hide. They don't have enough information about what's going on to make a, an informed decision about what to do for the best of their safety. That's very, very scary. I asked her, you know, all right, so you, you hear this, you know, what was going through your head? She heard the, she smelled the gunpowder. You know, did you try to text somebody? Did you try to call someone? And here's what she said. I tried to call first and um, my phone wasn't working. Like it, it just, there was no reception at all. So I put together a text message as quickly as I could. And I just said, someone's shooting. And then I I wrote on to say, I think I have screenshots of it because my phone ended up getting fucking smashed to shit. I went on to say that in the, like the second part of the text message, first I said it was one person. Then I said it was multiple people. Two of the messages got out, and I didn't get the response until the following day because all of the um, – I don't even know what you call them. All of the towers, they were tied up because yeah. – so many people were trying to call yeah. out and trying to, you know, text and call like 911 and stuff that yeah. it just was all fucked up and yeah. um, ended up replying to me. And he said, well, I think it's time for you to come home then. What the fuck? But I didn't get that until the next day. So, I mean, I didn't even know, like, I just told everybody that I loved them, that I was okay at the time, but I didn't know what was going to happen. How scary is that? That's terrifying. I mean, when you're sitting there, because around the, the burst, it was still coming, and you're just waiting for the next one. <laughs> and she's sitting there, not knowing where it's coming from. She pulls out her phone, text messages won't go through. And then she says, you know, I love you, trying to make amends or trying to, the you know, the last words. Like, I meant, that's, that's can you imagine that? No. Yeah, I've never, uh, obviously never been in, in a situation like this myself that panned out the way that this one did. But I'll, I won't, I'll never forget when I was going into, for one of my first field uh field experiences at a, a high school last year and there was a lockdown and this is right after oh the, yeah you tell me about that right after the parkland shooting and they there were parents in the lobby i was in the lobby i wasn't inside the school yet but you know they locked down the front of the building they wouldn't tell anyone what was going on and i remember texting my family and and saying, you know, like, I don't know what's going on, but we're under lockdown. So, I mean, being in a situation like that, obviously I was way more fortunate, but it's, you don't know what, what's going, what's going on. So, so at one point I'm underneath the set of bleachers and we thought that, you know, that we were safe under there. Well, you could hear them fucking ricocheting off of the bleachers. Yeah. And so, you know, we laid there for a minute, and then I was like, fuck this. We got to get up, and we have to start, like, running, to which we did, and we ended up in the back of the venue, and we had to hide behind an ambulance while there was more fire going off. All right, the same article. In this case, a Las Vegas shooting where Paddock was using a bump stock to automate his rifle, the same guy says, quote, the most obvious thing would have been the regularity of the automatic fire. So when you heard the automatic fire, yeah, it's fast, but it's at regular intervals. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's almost a beat to that, you know? Yeah. Firecrackers, you light a firecracker, they're like... That's how a firecracker sounds. Right. So I'm trying to tell you, that is maybe one thing that you can remember if you're ever in that situation. If someone is holding down a trigger of an automatic rifle that is a well-oiled machine designed for regularity of bullet rate fire that is going to have the same intervals as opposed to a firecracker because i don't think people know that and these videos show people don't know that how long was she out there for she stayed out there for three hours wow. 
helping people? Because we were in the venue for another three and a half, four hours after all this shit happened. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, we were we were back there just trying to trying to help, you know. Thank you so much for for trying to help people. That's that is uh, commendable for you to to stay there and try to help the wounded or, or help yeah. people get through. That's amazing, and thank you so much because a lot of people wouldn't be like that. So thank you. You know what? I it, I thought about that too, like afterwards, like a ton, you know, because at first I was like, man, this fucked up i saw a lot of people running why weren't they staying to help and um you know it took me like a while to get over that and this this sounds kind of messed up but i wasn't married i don't have kids i didn't really have like a lot of stuff like to run for like i'm not saying that i didn't care about myself or whatever absolutely i do but a lot of people that were there like there's children there you know there's a lot of families it was like a family type atmosphere so I can understand why people did not want to stay there. You know, yeah. I get it. And plus, it's easier to look in hindsight. I mean, we, you know, especially with getting shot at and stuff, it's easier to for someone to be like, "Oh, I would have did this. I would have did that." But you know, you're in you're in complete chaos. So for you to do what you did and stay was amazing. You'll notice in a lot of these videos when the the crowd they. As soon as the gunfire happens, they hit the the ground. They hit the deck. Okay, that's a natural response mm-hmm. of what we would do as a human. Is that the best response? I would say yes. If you don't have the information, if you don't know where the shooter's coming from, I think it's the best response because it makes yourself a smaller target. You know what I'm saying? If, if you don't know the shooter is shooting from above head, and you get down and try to make yourself a what well, in the military we call a smaller silhouette. For someone to shoot at, I think it's the best. But you'll see in a lot of the crowd, I think it's the psychology behind us. It's really interesting to say this stuff. The bullets stop firing. About half the people will start running, and the other half will stay. (laughs) So you can see, these are all cell phone videos. You see the hotel up there. You see the venue. This is towards the back of the stage. People are running. As soon as the bullets start flying, everyone's down. Everyone's down. Bullets are flying, everyone's down. You'll see people get up, they start running. They start running. They start running. Bullets start flying. Everyone hits the deck. All right, so we're trying to explain why some people run and why some people stay. So, Nicole, if you want to read this, this is the psychology of crowd behavior and emergency evacuations. However, while the word panic is a word frequently used to describe egress behavior in disasters, a closer inspection of the behavior of those affected rarely supports this idea of mass panic. Indeed, the behavior of crowds during disasters is often much more social than that with they are sometimes credited, with cooperation and altruism often predominating rather than selfish, uncooperative behavior. So he's basically saying that from what these researchers gathered that when you're in mass panic, so to speak, is that most people want to stay within the social group Mm -hmm. that they're in. They cut like they follow what everybody else is doing. Not, or I, uh, I would say that not f- fo- not follow what everyone else is doing. But I think that generally we feel safer in a in a, in a group of people mm. that are experiencing the same thing. Yeah. So if you if, if if you're in a group of people when something like this is happening, you want to stay with the group. Yeah. All right, so the first theory, there's two theories I want to talk about. The first one is the panic model, if you want to read this. It suggests that plans for the evacuation of buildings should focus on physical factors, such as the width of emergency exits to prevent jamming, rather than the psychological factors, such as the role of information and communication. In short, rather than being viewed as active, thinking agents, crowd members, are considered to flow in the same way as unthinking inanimate objects, such as ball bearings. This has implications for whether emergency planners 
decide to provide information to the public during emergencies, as there is often a concern that people will panic if they know the true gravity of the situation facing them. Therefore, information is often withheld despite there being little, if any, evidence to support the assertion. Hmm. That's pretty crazy. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I mean, that's in every, like, sci-fi movie about the world going to end, like, Arm- the movie yeah. Armageddon. Yeah, like, they would like, not... don't tell everyone. Yeah. yeah, it was, like, only the astronauts that knew yeah. that the asteroid was coming to destroy the planet. Yeah, because they don't want people to Mass run panic. for the door. And uh, Yeah. Um, but it is interesting, if you ever see an ex, the next exit, fire exit door I see, I'm going to see if it's really wider than normal doors because the the theory is that more people are trying to get through it so the door should be wider <laughs> i don't know um and the other is the social attachment model this is the most agreed upon model if you want to read that he argues that in times of danger people display affirmative behaviors where they attempt to move from unfamiliar situations toward people and places that they are familiar such as friends or family they will also try to evacuate within this familiar group rather than as individuals family and or friendship ties remain strong in these situations with mutual cooperation predominating within these groups as opposed to selfish uncooperative behavior in each of these cases evacuations from fires and buildings it was shown that rather than breaking down social bonds within groups endured during emergencies with people today tending to delay their individual flight to ensure safe evacuation of the group as a whole that d- hmm. do you guys that hear that makes you feel good mm-hmm. That is crazy, isn't it? No, I'm not saying they'll consciously do it, but they'll suppress their their fight or flight instincts to stay within their social with their, group. With their group. All right, yeah, us three are at a concert. We're in a group when we go to the concert. Now it's an active shooter situation. Everyone in our vicinity is our new group. We're right. all in a situation together. Because we're, all, we're experiencing yeah. it together. So it's kind of like, who said it? I think Ronald Reagan or somebody was like, if we're ever attacked by alien, you know, outside extraterrestrials, that's when the world will come together and we'll all work together as a whole. I don't know who said that, some president. Hmm. But I mean, it's the same thing. Like, if we all have the same dilemma, we're all in that group. So people today seem to stay in that same social group, which you can definitely see in the video. Yes. Yeah. There's, there are people... That are leaving, obviously, but the majority are staying. And there's nothing that you can control. I, I, but I wanna, is that the right thing? I, I don't want to say right and wrong. I want to say that's nothing you can control. And the reason I'm being so specific about that is there's very important fact I want to bring up later that I can't bring up now because it piss you guys off so much if I bring it up right now. You can see that too similar – in wartime as well, if you're at war, I mean, obviously I can't speak to it, but like um, soldiers going back to get their 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 yeah com- comrades and things like that. Like they want the survival is the goal for not just humans, but for all species. But that's also trained, right? Like you're you not from what this team. is saying. I mean, they're saying that it's yeah, it's trained, but it's I mean, unconsciously. As humans in today's world, we'll stick with the group. That's what it's saying. I don't know. I mean, you see it on the video. These people don't know each other. You think all those thousands no, oh, of people no, know each I'm other? Not saying that. But they're they're all bound by. And all the videos, the cell phone videos I saw, that people were helping people they didn't know. People were protecting people they didn't know. So there were there were guys and girls laying on top of other people to protect them that they didn't know. There are more good people than bad. Right. How did one person bring 21 suitcases filled with 23 guns? Not just guns. Everyone's like, all the news are like, how did he get 23 guns in there? Fuck the guns. How did he get 23 guns, all the ammunition? He also had security cameras that he was live videoing down the hall so he can see who's coming. How did he get all this stuff into the hotel room is what I'm trying to ask. All right, so this is the timeline before the shooting. Shooting happened when? October 1st, 2017. We're going to Monday, September 25th, 2017. This is when he started prepping, okay? It's not a lot of prep time. It's, no, I'm talking about... he. No, he's been prepping for months. I'm sorry, oh. I didn't mean that. He's been probably been prepping for months, three months, six months, a year probably. I'm talking about... From Monday, September 25th is when he brought the first bag of weapons into his room that he had, he rented all week. Now, he rented two rooms. He rented a suite on the 32nd floor and the adjacent room. The adjacent room was rented in his girlfriend's name, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. 
Monday, September 25th, 2017, Stephen Paddock checks into a suite at the MGM's Mandalay Bay Hotel on the 32nd floor, suite 135. He also books the adjoining room 134, and he spends two hours in this room. And then he goes into the lobby where he enjoys a nice sushi dinner and watches TV. And there's video. You guys want to see video of it. I mean, it's just him going to the lobby and eating sushi, talking to the the hotel staff, being buddy-buddy, I don't all like to normalize stuff. people like this. Being buddy-buddy with everyone. Just before 5 p.m., he drives his Chrysler minivan up to the valley area, and the bellman unloads his car with five suitcases. Now, if you guys want to count on your fingers, because we're going to keep track here. He requests to stay with his luggage, which really isn't abnormal, but he does request to go through the service elevator, which he does. Now, these bags are really heavy, obviously. 5.30 to 9. Are you allowed to do that? Stephen Paddock is a high roller. He spends a lot of money in the Mandalay Hotel. He gets kickbacks. He's buddy-buddy with everyone. Just because the, the casino says, I don't know who the shit this guy was. Yeah, he's spending, I think, $48 million in 2015 in your your hotel, your what? casino. What? You know who he is, okay? This is one, one of the barriers we're going to break is this whole denial of liability thing which we're gonna get to trust me i'm out for some fucking blood on this i'm talking about doing another podcast specifically to this fucking shit you'll hear what i'm talking about in a second anyway five suitcases go up to his room 5 30 9 30 he spends the next four hours in his room 9 40 p.m he walks out of the hotel carrying two suitcases most likely empty right he done emptied them out and he drives his car one hour to his mesquite home. And this is this is all mapped out with cell phone because they got, a, you know, cell phone they know what he, I, he uh, triangulations or whatever. They know yeah. where he was at the whole time. Now, he spends the night there at his home. How is this guy renting a suite and an adjacent room? Plus, he's renting another hotel we're about to talk about at the same time. How is he renting all this stuff? Well, I mean, he is wealthy-ish, you know, I would imagine. So is he? I mean, like, if, if he spent millions I, of dollars at a casino, I would imagine he has well, to be. I, I mean, I, he's a he was a real estate developer and a, a high stakes gambler. So he has some money. Yeah, I don't think he's like. I think he's worth like two million. Maybe I saw a figure there. No one really knows, which is so bullshit. They can't. So when he spends forty eight million, he's. Yeah, I'm going to get to that. That's his expected value. 30. That year he lost nine. 500 grand. The IRS believes that he earned 5 million in 2015 playing video poker. Now that's what the IRS believes from his his I- income forms. The Nevada Independent Paper did their own private research and found that he most likely lost 500,000. His gross earnings were probably somewhere around $48,148,142. That is a number I've never seen before in my life. I, I want to see that number in my bank account. Yeah, for but, real. but he lost. Yeah, he lost 500000 So the video. Wait, no, he lost. You said it was $41 million. He lost. No, he really lost 400000 His gross earnings were 48148142 That was gross. Listen. Video poker machines, the expected return is 99.17, like I said earlier. So his expected coin-in value, basically what he would bring home, is 48553000 which is about a difference of 500000 They also concluded that he played 485 and a half hours, which is just over nine hours per week for that year. And in the whole year, even though he brought home 48 million 148 he lost 48 million 553 so he lost 500,000 gotcha I do want to say real quick and not going into the background the family background but just kind of to kind of get a sense of who this guy was his father Benjamin Hoskins Paddock was on the FBI's most top 10 most wanted list really Mm -hmm. that's interesting Benjamin Hoskins Paddock. Now, this is from the uh, Clarion Ledger from Friday, June 13th, 1969. 
Benjamin Hoskins paddocked his, paddocked his dad, an escaped federal prisoner who reportedly has suicidal tendencies and is known to his associates as Chrome Dome, Chrome Dome, and uh, oh boy, like the name <laughs> Chrome Dome. <laughs> well, you uh, read? I feel is that a prison nickname? You read these names; they're that's funny re- if you read them. That's really like creepy. Here, oh, Chrome Old Dome Baldy. and Old, Big Daddy, Old Baldy and Big Daddy. He has been added to the FBI's most wanted fugitives list, and he was. The article goes on to say he was a bank robber and he and a prison escapee. So that was his dad. Now, Stephen Paddock grew up kind of poor. His dad wasn't around. He left. His mother, the mother, raised three boys off a of secretary salary. Now, Mary Lou Danley was his girlfriend at the time. Not much is known by her. There's some speculation that she was involved. Number one, the hotel room, not the suite, but the hotel room was registered in her name plus there were a few witnesses that said they saw her on the day but she was traveling to the philippines during that time she's from the philippines the week before this incident happened paddock wired her a hundred thousand dollars now they were in they were in some kind of domestic hmm. uh breakup or something she was living down in florida at the time in the how the retirement home that they once lived in together okay and then he moved to mesquite but before this happened he wired her a hundred thousand dollars Interesting. yeah and she's claiming she kn- knew nothing yeah court documents and I, i've read plenty of the court documents they say that she was traveling through the u.s she didn't know anything about this whole setup or anything like that. Tuesday, September 26, 2017, he spends most of the day at his Mesquite home. So this is Tuesday. Remember, the concert is on that Sunday, that October 1st. Now, but this is Tuesday. Okay. He's bringing in all his weapons. Around 8 p.m., he drives back to Las Vegas. He stops at the Ogden, which is a downtown condominium complex where he was also renting several rooms for a, in the entire week. Why was he at the Ogden? I don't know. Maybe he just liked the view. Or maybe because the Life is Beautiful Music Fest was also going on around that time. And he was trying to scope it out to see if that would be his target, which is most likely the case. That's why he rented the rooms there. Internet records from Paddock's computer shows that he searched for the event and the uh, Route 91 event and their expectant attendance of each event. So he is mapping out, okay, which one's the best target to mm-hmm. kill the maximum amount of people? That is through his, I can tell you for a fact that's what was going through his head. Life is beautiful, uh, Blink-22, you know, or Jason Aldean with 22,000 fans. All right, late Tuesday night, Paddock returns to the Mandalay, and a different bellman helped him carry seven more suitcases. Seven. Hey, man, that's a lot of damn suitcases. What you got in there? No, they don't ask that. They would ask a normal person that. Jen, if you go down to the Mandalay even before this, you bring seven suitcases, you don't think security is going to be like, well, who the, let me see what's in there. They will. And. But because he was a high roller, they didn't do all that stuff. He's on camera. There's the thing about this casino there's someone always watching the damn cameras. Right. Okay? It's not like you're robbing a grocery store they're, and they're like, can I check that camera? Yeah, I guess. The they're tapes. choosing to ignore this. They're ignoring this. Yeah. They're fucking ignoring the fact that he just brought 12 suitcases. What the fuck would someone need with 12 suitcases? I don't give a shit. Like You got a th- 100 suits in there? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's... Sh- where are you going? You gonna dress the he's entire? Not, he's not bringing them in all at once, in? but he's still br- like seven at a time yeah, when he's weird. only there for seven and days. And he doesn't have anyone with him; he's by himself. Yeah. So it's not like you're on a family vacation and you each have a suitcase. Yeah. yeah. So now we have twelve suitcases all through the service elevator. He then goes down to the lobby, talks to you know, hey man, how's it going, big old Bob? Man, I miss you. I'm gonna gamble here. He gambles for eight hours. Now slot machines was his thing. He spent a lot of money on slot machines. And slot machines have a very bad ratio of earnings. I think I saw the figure of 99% out of like 100, which is less than, you know, one. So you spend a dollar, you make 99 
cent back. Now that's over the long run. That's like statistics. Right. Out of a dollar. Uh, yeah, the expected. Wait, make you make back. a penny back? No, 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 no. And you I'm lose a penny. I'm not a statistician, but the average over a long period of play from a slot machine is you play with a dollar and you get back ninety nine cents. So you lose a penny. That's not that bad. But I guess that is very lose, bad over a money. long time. Yeah, anything's bad over a long period of time. That's why Spread he had that out over thirty five million dollars. <laughs> That's why they came uh, up with the figure that I'm gonna show you in a little bit that he lo- he made forty eight million in gross revenue, but he actually his profit was a loss at like five hundred grand, which they were trying to make that a motive. I don't know. Um, he spends eight hours into the slot machines until the. So hey, he wasn't making money gambling. He was losing money gambling. He is a very private person, from what I saw. His financials are very hard to dig into. He, I think he was rich. I don't think he was. He wasn't making money gambling. Exactly. I think that's the problem. And he was gambling a lot. Um, now, I'm not saying that's the motive. I, I didn't mean to say that's the problem. But Now, yeah. Wednesday, September 27th. So remember, the, the event is in four days. And he's already got, what, 12 suitcases in the hotel room? He spends most of the day in his room and then repeats the pattern. Basically, he leaves the Mandalay carrying those two empty suitcases. He stops at the Ogden, the other hotel, and then he drives back to his home in Mesquite. Thursday, September 28th. He buys a 308 bolt action rifle from a local gun store, Guns and Guitars. That's the name wow. of the freaking store. They decided to sell him all kinds of shit, apparently. He then visits the nearby gun range. He drives back to Mandalay. He gets another bellman to help him carry a white container and an additional three suitcases up to his room. He has now carried 15 suitcases into his hotel room. That he is renting by himself. And don't you think, like, house housekeeping as well would be like, oh, what, is, what are all these suitcases? Like, Yeah. Friday, September 29th, Paddock stays in his room until about 3 p.m. He uses the internet. He checks into his adjoining room using his girlfriend's name. We're, we're going to talk about his girlfriend. How many guns did he use? He had 23 guns in total. And that is a lot because I, it's not like unique? little pistols. I mean, you can put 23 pistols in a big suitcase. These right. are big Rifles, AR-15 rifles. Wait, I'm sorry. So did he? Ha- ha- so did he use all the guns? Like, wh- no, he didn't use all the guns. No. Why? I don't know. I just feel like that's really. There is a theory out there. I don't buy it. I don't think it has any validity. But he was an arms dealer, and it was a arms deal gone wrong. I don't believe it. I think he just no. stockpiled a bunch of weapons because he wanted just to case. make sure he had enough. Because he would, he would prep. I'm assuming he had them all prepped and loaded in their ammo, so he wouldn't have to keep changing ammo and guns. Yes, he was using a hundred round magazines, which are fucking huge, mm-hmm. to hold a hundred rounds. That's why you hear the the rapid fire burst. That's literally a hundred rounds going through that barrel. Now he also on that Friday he tells staff to leave behind the food service cart that was already used. The fi- All right, so he got food service. And this is on Friday. Some nice crab legs or whatever, whatever the rich people eat. And then he says, you know what? Don't take this empty food service cart away. Leave it right in front of my door and do not touch it. Interesting. He requested to leave the cart in, right in front of his door that was, you know, the food cart that should have been taken away. I mean, it was just, the food was done, and but it stayed there for two days. <laughs> There's like, a lot of things that, like, I personally have never worked for a casino. I never would, but I have a lot of friends that work in the, you know, in the service industry, and they'll tell you, too. If it was just any any other person, you or I, that decided we wanted to leave that fucking food cart outside, yeah. Absolutely not. Is someone not answering their door for X amount of days or refusing maid service? Hell no. Because that would never fly, especially for two days. You want to leave that there for two days? In a nice swanky hotel? In a nice hotel with your your freaking half-eaten PB&J sandwich and your crab legs right there? You going to leave that for two days and expect no one to pick it up? No. But if you're a fucking high roller, 
spending millions at a hotel, everyone knows who you are, even though they're denying knowing this guy, then they'll let you get away with this stuff. Maybe he's just a crazy guy. Maybe he just he just likes the smell of the old food sitting there. In reality, we now know his motive for that. Number one, it blo- it is an extra barrier for people to coming in. Mm-hmm. But most importantly, oh, a camera. A camera. Under the dish. Look at that. Under the empty dish, there's a camera. It's not even that well hid. No. There exactly. It's not well hid. There is a camera that is doing a live feed until hit and into his room so he can tell if someone is coming up there to stop him. And they could not take that service food cart away for reasons unbeknownst to me. Wow. I mean, yeah, that's really out in the open there. All right, that's Saturday, a day before. He arrives back at the Mandalay at 6. No, he goes home the following night. That Friday night, he goes back to his home. Saturday, he arrives bright and early, 6 a.m. at the Mandalay, brings two additional suitcases. Around noon, he places a do not disturb sign on both of the room doors. He also declines housekeeping. He also tells them, don't touch my fucking cart. Okay. Now he takes an elevator to the valet area where he waits for his car to come up to valet. And then he pulls two additional suitcases out of his car. Now he's at 19 suitcases. In a hotel room. Sir, did you want to live here permanently? Are you moving every belonging in your house in here? Because if that's so, that's fine. But I'm still going to have to check your suitcases because you brought fucking 19 of them into the hotel. He then gambles all night on his slot machines and then he goes back to his home. Sunday, October 1st. It's like he's not even staying there. It's, it's weird. Because he's putting a stockpile there. Because he, I know, in retrospect, we know what's going on, but I'm saying like he's yeah. like. In retrospect, not even retrospect, they should have fucking known that he brought 21 suitcases into a hotel room. One guy staying there. Are you out of your fucking mind? What even the shitty ass Motel Six that we stayed in wouldn't allow that shit. Imagine we just brought 21 suitcases up in that bitch. Mm-hmm. Sunday, he returns to the Mandalay at 3 a.m. in the morning, and he gambles all night in the high-limit slot, high limit slot area, and he returns to his room at 7.37. At 12.16 p.m., he goes back into the parking garage. Now, he's seen on video, Pastor, this is crazy. He's seen around noontime, 12.16, all these people are going to the concert. He's waiting for him. Oh, yeah. Hey, how are you guys going? Oh, and then he gosh. goes into the elevator. Hey, no, it's fine. You take your time. I'll wait. In about 12 hours, I'm going to try to kill every one of you guys. Sick fuck. And he goes in the elevator. Like, nothing fucking wrong. These are, look how young these people are. And he's bringing more suitcases in. Look at that. Fucking crazy. Right to the front door. They won't even notice. He returns to his car. And what you're watching now is a video of him bringing two more suitcases in. He locks the deadbolt of both the rented rooms, and at 10 p.m., Jason Aldean is playing his headline, and then that brings us back to Faithful 1005, where the shooting rampage begins. This is how they found Stephen Paddock when they entered his room. I'm showing them a picture right now. Oh, my goodness. So he obviously put that revolver, if you see the revolver right there, put it in his mouth, blew his brains out. And see all those shell casings? Uh Uh-huh. Wow. Get that off the screen. Yikes. That's going to be a nightmare tonight. (laughs) You asked how they found, they, they knew he was up there. Yeah. There was a guy, a security guard that was checking, his name was, his name was Jesus Campos. He was checking doing his normal routine, normal rounds that night, and he noticed he was on the 31st floor. He was going up to the 32nd and noticed a bracket that was barring the door, the fire escape, from being opened. Now, I do want to say Ellen DeGeneres was the first one to interview this guy, and I looked into that, and I'm never going to watch any more of Ellen ever again in my life. Really? After I tell you what I'm going to tell you. But the door was jammed, barred. Someone had actually, you know, put 
something to, you couldn't open the door. Right. Okay. He came up to the room through the other way, to, through the back way. He comes down the hall and he pushes open the fire door. The first, there's two fire doors. He pushes open the big heavy fire door. Mm-hmm. He checks the door. He sees that it's been intentionally blocked off. He calls down to the front. They know nothing about it. Now, this is when the timeline gets iffy, and I'm going to get into that, but he says he heard sounds of a jackhammer huh. or some sort of electric tool. He didn't know what was going on. He certainly didn't think it was a shooter. He goes back out down the hall past the suite where Stephen Paddock was in. Stephen Paddock comes out of the room and opens fire yeah. at Jesus de Campo, Jesus oh, Campo, goodness. and shoots him. Mm. In the leg. Yeah. He calls down to the front, and that's how they knew where the room was. Oh. That's how, because, I mean, he had a he had one-on-one with a shooter. Now, let me get into something that's going to fucking piss you off before oh, we end this boy. thing. MGM owns the Mandalay. Right. MGM is a big company. They make billions, whatever. Mm-hmm. All right. 58 people died that night. 22,000 people were there. Was it 851 were injured? Mm -hmm. I don't even know how to say this. MGM comes out. They decided this would be a good idea. Instead of helping provide closure to these families, they thought it would be a good idea to bring lawsuits to them and sue sue the victims. What? Yes. they're, They're suing victims yeah, it, it makes me sick to my stomach. It, it makes me sick. What? So, I got sued. I got sued fucking twice. Wait, and you got sued? Yeah, I got sued. And I can laugh about it, like, a little bit now. But, um, at the You're time, joking. Was, no, yeah, I there, swear. There's I can, no... I can send you the documents. I swear to God. There I is no sued. prosecutor on the face of the earth that has the audacity to push that. Tell, please tell me they didn't take you to court or anything. Well, they, they tried to. The first time, they just let it go. The second time, I got served at work, and it was right after, I think it was right after the first anniversary. So it was just kind of like a sketchy time to begin with. I just felt uneasy, you know, still living here. And then to have somebody come into my work, which, you know, that was embarrassing in itself. They're suing the victims, saying they have... They're using this federal anti-terrorism law. But keep in mind, this isn't terrorism. Oh, my God. This is a crazed maniac that brought 21 suitcases full of AR-15s into your fucking hotel room. The FBI never claimed this was terrorism. And who gives a shit? You got 58 fucking dead people in a goddamn stadium that you own from a fucking shooter that you housed up and let bring 23 fucking rifles. And now you're going to sue a thousand plus fucking victims and their fucking families of the deceased. They're saying, oh, you should have fucking ran. You shouldn't have stayed there in the fucking line of fire. Verbatim, it says in the paperwork that um, I sustained injuries. Because I chose to remain in the line of fire. Are you fuck? fucking kidding me? Oh my I god! I swear to God. And then to actually read the documents that fucking set me off into a rampage. And um, oh my god, you know, I- yeah. The, the first time I let it go, the second time I was like, "Fuck this shit." So I went and I got. Um, I have four lawyers now because I wasn't going to sue or anything like that. I just figured, you know what? I was in the wrong place at the wrong time shit happens, it really can't be, you know, not one single person can be held accountable for this is how I was looking at it. But then when they just kept fucking with me, I'm like, you know what? I got, I'm over this, you know, I'm over it. And they said what they were trying to do was limit their liability because they, um, they were claiming that they didn't have an active shooter policy, which, um, later it was found out they were fucking lying and they actually have one for $750 million. So they didn't want to pay that out to to all the victims and, and the, you know, the people that actually lost a loved one. And the, the even more fucked up part is that a lot of the, the care that I received, I paid for that shit myself mm. with my insurance. And then my insurance company then came back to me and said, hey, wait a minute. 
like, why are you, you know, why are you having all this stuff done? Why are you seeing a psychiatrist? We're not fucking paying for this. You need to fill out this form and explain, you know, what happened, um, which I did so. And then they contacted me and said, you know, we shouldn't be held liable for all these payments. We're now going to sue MGM over it. And I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. Yes. What? Yes. This is a fucking shit. Yes. Yes. No. Yes, I'm not fucking making this up. It makes me goddamn sick to my fucking stomach is what it does. Fucking sick. Heartbreaking sick. You've got to be shitting me. Because if they don't have enough money anyway, and they, it's like you're pu- you're just pouring They're more pain on top of anything. trying to make themselves look better. Like, they were, they were not at fault in any way. Wow, this is fucked up. So they'll name, they named 1,600 people. They were suing people who fucking passed away. And their families, their children. Like, oh. I, yeah, it's bad. It's bad. Yeah, that's, and then, um, yeah, there's some other shit. I'm sure I don't even want to talk about it, honestly. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> they're trying not to pay out anything. And they're doing it by suing the people that have died and their families that are in the grieving process. That's disgusting. Yeah, it's very disgusting. They say people people died twice. Once when they first died. And then again when you stop talking about them. I post pictures about my wife every day on social media. We talk about her all the time. We celebrate her and love her very much and miss her. I was recently uh, informed by some friends that I was being sued by MGM. <laughs> You've got to be shitting me. This is and a I'm real going, thing. I'm going through all this. And They're still suing going this and, these fucking and people. find out that this huge company, MGM Resorts, is suing me. I mean, how, how do you deal with that? It's I mean, fucking... You, you know... I don't know what this Look, is this video has 724 views. That's it. From the Associated Press. The Associated Press from last year. This video has 724 views. You fucking tell me what's the fucking problem here. You type in Mandalay Bay, you can't find shit about a fucking shooting. Half these goddamn videos that you type into YouTube have been removed. Okay? It's really bad. I was so upset by it. The first time, I, I don't really think it sunk in very much but just because I was, you know, I was going through, like, a lot of surgeries. The security guard, Jesus DeCampo, hero, also paid off by MGM that first week because there's plenty of articles I found. Where's where's the security guard, the hero? Where'd he go? No one can see him. He was staying in a suite at the Mandalay or whatever fucking hotel they have being paid off. And why do you think Ellen DeGeneres got the exclusive interview? Because they knew a, a fucking she wasn't real journalism, national news would rip him a fucking part because the timeline comes into question the timeline's not accurate. They, they're denying responsibility. They paid off the security guard. Now they're suing the fucking victims, including <laughs> which she has been sued three fucking times. Fuck that. This hotel does not need to be fucking standing. This company does not need to be fucking standing. That is unacceptable. And no one is doing shit. No one knows about this fucking case because they got so much fucking money that they push it down and pretend it's not something it is. It is. It happened. And people are struggling. People are fucking really struggling. This is from the Lombardo law firm. Attorney Kathleen Lombardo is proven correct one year later. MGM, MGM paid, off sequestered, paid off and sequestered security guard Jesus Campos. They paid him off. They made him sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, and that the Ellen DeGeneres TV show appearance was scripted. He's Mm. on Ellen DeGeneres, and I knew something wasn't right when I watched that. Yeah, he's a hero, but I knew something wasn't right. Can we see it? Yeah, it's fucking bullshit. And Ellen fucking DeGeneres, her staff and her, they knew about this payoff. You want to you want to be in this shit so, too? Fuck you. So they you. paid him. So what was exactly his 
his payoff that he wouldn't talk about what really yeah, happened. Yeah, so because was, the timeline sh- comes into play. So he was the fact that the shooter ca- came out and shot him and then possibly went back in yes, to keep shooting. They're saying that the shooter came out and shot him first before he shot at any of the crowd. That's what he's saying. And if that's the case, that means well, he, they, he are heard mo- sound. they are more liable. Yeah, that's what he told Ellen DeGeneres. A, a episode that was completely fucking scripted. No, no, no. I'm saying... Well, um, he came out to Ellen DeGeneres and said, this is what happened. And that was scripted. He was coached okay, to say okay, this stuff. Okay, so we think... Okay, so he's he's telling the public that he heard sounds that sounded like a jackhammer, went to investigate, whatever, yeah. and then he was shot. Yeah. And then that ended up being the downfall of this guy. Versus what we think... What you think really happens or what yeah. you think is coming out is that... He was shot before yes, anything happened. because he noticed the door was jammed. Called down to the front prior. desk. And the front desk yes. took 15 minutes to get somebody up there. Yes. Gotcha. And they didn't follow procedures or anything. And so... <sighs> yeah. So they paid him off because the time... Because in reality, he was the first person shot, possibly, versus the last person, aside from the shooter himself. All right, you can read this. Luis Castro said his former brother-in-law, Mandalay Bay security officer Jesus Campos, told him that MGM Resorts International knew that the gunman Stephen Paddock had suspicious amount of luggage and guns in his room, but security neglected it because of his high roller status. He he said Campos signed a non-disclosure agreement with MGM. Campos received an all-expenses-paid trip and gifted two condos where he could reside. <laughs> gifted two condos. Castro claims. MGMRI hid Campos under guard at the Vadera Hotel and Spa after October 1st, 2017, Las Vegas massacre for protection where his room and meals were provided, Castro said. Hmm. And Ellen DeGeneres and her staff knew about this, and they were in on this scripted bullshit. So if you go home and you watch Ellen, you can just say, hey— you're a fucking evil person to even think of taking a damn buyout from this is in fucking sane. You want to give someone two condos? Why don't you use some of that money instead of suing everyone to actually help people? Which is why we talked about the mass psychology. That's why I brought it up. Why would someone stay in their line of fire? You don't have a fucking choice. You have no information about what the fuck is happening. Like, and you can, and especially in that instance, you don't know where the fire is coming. Like, yeah. And if, yeah, where if do you, go, you go? If you go one way, you could be going into the line of fire instead of so staying what, where you are and happened? knowing you're not like, going to get. Is she is in the process she, of still getting still sued. They are suing the victim. Oh. I'm sorry that your your daughter passed away at the concert. I know she was having a good time there. Uh, do you mind paying us this huge settlement? Because we're suing you as a family because she shouldn't have been there. She should have fucking left. This is the corporate fucking shit that... It, it, oh, my yes. God. So what do you guys want to do? I wish we could do something, but what can we do? Hopefully this episode gets millions of views and, and I'll come out fucking say fuck MGM. This is bullshit. And not only that, fuck any artist that ever plays and books MGM ever again. And if you ever stay in an MGM hotel, you might as well just be fucking spitting on the victims. And that includes every fucking artist, big artist that decides to play at MGM from now on. You are just as fucking guilty. This is not acceptable by any means. And it's not acceptable that it's not even fucking newsworthy. 724 fucking views. What the shit? Are you fucking serious? The Associated Press video, 724 views, and three of those were from me from today. Oh, my God. This that's, is- that's those, I'm not, I, and I'm not trying to add insult to injury, but 724 views, that that's less than the amount of victims of this massacre. Yeah, do you know why? If you go and look up yeah. Mandalay videos... You won't see anything about the mass shooting, the the largest mass shooting in U.S. history. But you see all about their new spas and their, oh, my God, Cirque de Olay or whatever. Oh, my God, come see Cirque de Olay. Cirque de Olay. Whatever, man. Cirque de Olay, I swear to jeez, man. <laughs> it's Cirque de Olay. <laughs> Cirque de Soleil. <laughs> Cirque. Cirque de Soleil. I swear to God, I can laugh about it like a little bit now. 
but um, I got, I'm over this. You know, I'm over it. And they're bullying. Yeah. They're bullying victims. But not I just, just don't that. understand why. But not just that. Because like, they're trying to save their fucking ass. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that makes it even worse. These people are trying to move on with their lives, and obviously, you're not going to forget something like that happens. Like you, you, when once once you experience a traumatic event like that, it's not just like, all right, well, I guess I'll go walk my dog now and forget that this happened. Like they're going to be stuck with this memory for the rest of their lives, and it's going to impact them for the rest of their lives. And just when they think that they're moving on and turning a corner and making some progress to go back to a normal life, you're going to remind them yeah. of what happened. Of of nursing people back to or trying to protect people and making sure that they're still alive by serving them a fucking lawsuit. Get it's, over yourself. It's bullying. It's, it's bullying is victims. It's, it's unacceptable. This I've, is ridiculous. I mean, Bill Clinton was throwing people on train tracks. That's one thing. That sucks in itself. But this is, this is a, a whole new level of shit, and no one knows about it. I, I, no. I, can't, I cannot believe This is not it. newsworthy, people. 58 people gunned down in Vegas does not make the news. It would if it wasn't a billion something dollar fucking company behind it. What? If this was in a school, what fucking precedent could they even have? Like, what other case could there possibly be where that has been? They're they're claiming this federal anti terrorism law where fucking bullshit. They have eight hundred million dollars. The MGM has $800 million of insurance for stuff like this, and they are refusing to pay a dime. Instead, they're sending out lawsuits. Their fucking tentacles are wrapped around it. They must like have a some other fucking mollusk. Fuck those victims. They shouldn't have been standing there. You heard gunshots. Why didn't you jump over that fucking fence? You know? Why didn't you dodge the bullets? Why didn't you know where this was coming from? We had all these cops. It was completely surrounded by cops. You shouldn't have died. Where were the cops? I don't know. I didn't see any. Did y'all? I mean, how many videos did we watch? Did y'all see one cop there? Mm-mm. No. I saw, actually, I did see one security guard. There we go. 22,000 people were there. A thousand of those people were over a thousand, including the deceased. No, not the deceased. Because, I mean, you can't sue a dead person, but you can sue their family that weren't even at the concert. So they're sending notices and lawsuits to the family right now. And that is still ongoing. And it's still ongoing. And and, and, the, and for the record, guys, that's why we're protecting um, identity because of what's pending and ongoing. And, and if that's you, fucked up. If you type in the hashtag that was so trending, I saw the news, MGM boycott, hashtag MGM boycott. Put that in Twitter. Six results. Six results from that hashtag. Six. Don't believe me? Fucking do it. Put it in Twitter. Hashtag MGM boycott. Ha- uh, hashtag boycott MGM. Six fucking results. One of them was, was a completely different case, an electrocution case. It has nothing to do with this. Six results. I'm pretty speechless. I yeah, gotta say. I, I don't really know what to say. I've never heard of anything yeah, so it's stupid. fucked up in my entire life. It doesn't make sense. And no one gives a shit. No one cares. No one cares about this case at all because it's swept under the rug. The deadliest, most deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history, 58 people killed in under 10 minutes, 23 AR-15 style rifles in a hotel room after a week of bringing 21 bags in, leaving a food cart that was empty, needed to be taken two days ago. That was outfitted with live stream cameras and a mass shooting that the MGM Grand doesn't want to release the funds dedicated for something like this. Wow. That's what we're dealing with. That's why I'm saying they make a lot of their money from performers. Cirque, Cirque de Delay. What is it? Cirque, de, Cirque, Cirque, Cirque de Delay. Circus Delay. <laughs> <laughs> Circus delay. What is it? <laughs> they make a lot. Circus delay. circus delay. They made a lot of money from circus delay and other performers like that. It's on you now. If you ever hear this podcast, it's on you. You well, can say you, you don't we'll have to want to be there. there. 
Huh? I, so I'll guarantee we'll never fucking go there. I mean, imagine a soldier coming back from war. Imagine that someone threw a lawsuit at me. I, 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 Are you fucking shitting me? Where my head's going? I'd fucking it's, go up in there with a fucking shotgun and be like, "Hey, I want to sign this." Ch-ch-ch. Anyway. Well, I um, I, once again feel very honored that we were asked to tell your personal story. It means so much to us. Mm -hmm. I hope that you feel like we've done it some justice and most importantly shed some light on this very, very sick and fucking twisted situation. So hopefully that there's um, a call to action that all of our tacos listening feel like they um, they have a clear path to. There's some definitely some things that we'll be following up about this case in particular. Can't thank you enough for for sharing that personal side of your story yep. it really means a lot to it us does. Yep. if you've enjoyed this episode and want to hear others like it be sure to hit that subscribe button on whatever podcasting app you use if you like this episode follow us on social media facebook instagram twitter if you're absolutely obsessed with this podcast and want to become our stalker go to talkmer.com slash join become a talk host primo get a badass t-shirt sticker swag a lot of love shout out all over the place tell me what story you may do i'll research it dedicate it to you every thursday talk Murder to me podcast my name is john here with jen and nicole until next time kids Don't play slots at the MGM Grand.